let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, Lord, our Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp for our feet and a light unto our path. And so we pray you that you would open and enlighten our minds that we might comprehend your word clearly, purely, and faithfully. And so comprehending it, may we conform our lives according to it, that we may never bring your most high majesty to anger. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our dear Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit are one true God, and you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. All right. Before we get back to John chapter 8, anything that you'd like to talk about from the sermon on Sunday? We had Jesus calming the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Not to be confused with when Jesus walks on the water, which we'll hear later in the summer, I think. Right now, the way that our lectionary works Since we're on our uh, three-year cycle, um, we focus on one gospel throughout the year. So right now we're in year B, which is the year of Mark. So we we don't hear from Mark every single Sunday, but uh, like we don't hear from him at Christmas time because there's no Christmas story of Mark. We go back to Luke. But right now in the summer, in the season after Pentecost, now we kind of basically just go right through We don't hit everything, but we basically just go through the gospel chapter by chapter. So that's what we're doing right now. But, uh, all right. Seeing no one. Everybody doing good? Happy? Healthy? All right. A little sunshine. A little sunshine? (laughs) But I'm not complaining. Yes. Well, did you hear that thunder the other morning? Oh, yeah. That was great. We had all of our windows open as it was, and that bang, bang, bang. And of course, can you hear the pitter patter of little feet? <laughs> and, uh, Gloria, however, slept through the whole thing. So, yes. Yeah. I used to, well, I think I usually do that for storms. I remember growing up, every so often we would have tornadoes in North Carolina and uh, one time I was in bed I don't know how old I was maybe high school and uh, there had been a bad storm and then you could hear this like whooshing sound and uh, I woke up and I'm like gosh that sounds really weird and my mom comes in the door and she says I think a tornado just went right over the house oh, wow. <laughs> They're like, well Too late. yeah <laughs> What's the point of being scared after you've been through something like that? It's like, it could have happened, but it didn't. So. From from this last one? Yeah, and you know, when a tree falls, you look out there, and it's like, well, it's on the ground, it's covered by everything. You don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Hopefully not your favorite, but it's gone My favorite. My favorite tree in my yard, right in about head and half. The two big branches are gone now. Struck by lightning or it just got hit by something? I think it was just hollow Uh and old and the wind knocked it down. I don't think it was a big, other than just, it was its time Mm. to go. Yeah. (laughs) Pretty strong. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Well, in that case, I see the connection to the gospel there. You know, (laughs) natural catastrophe. All right, John chapter 8, we're kind of right in the middle of things. To review really quick, Jesus is in the temple teaching. Chapter 8 began with uh, the woman caught in adultery that we talked about quite a bit. And then last time we moved to beginning in verse 12, when we have that second I am saying from Jesus when he says, I am the light of the world, and that tees off the Jews. And so we have then this whole uh, back and forth that was going on. That Jesus talked about having witnesses, how the Father bears witness to him. And, uh, and basically he reiterates something that we've heard and will continue to hear, which is uh, if you want to know the Father, then you have to know the Son. That Jesus is the way, he's the key, um, he is the revelation of God. And where we stopped 
right at the end of that section in verse 28. So Jesus is telling them what the, the, um, the capstone of his revelation is, like what it means to know God, to know who God is. So that's where we stop, verse 28. So right in the middle of what Jesus says. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Remember, that's what the Greek says. There's no he there. It's I am. And that I do nothing on my own authority. You can scratch that out. That's, that's that same uh, error in translation we talked about. He says literally, I do nothing of myself. He doesn't act apart from the Father. The Father and the Son. The, the point is not subordination. The point is the unity between the Father and the Son. So I do nothing from myself, of myself, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. All right, before we leave this part behind, and I can't quite recall what we talked about, other than I am. Uh, this is another statement, very clear statement of Jesus' divinity. And this is one of the ways in which he continually teaches, and he tells the Jews or whoever is going to listen that he is one with the Father, that he's divine, he's God. That I am is that divine name of God that God first reveals to Moses, uh, that uh, he says, go and tell the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And uh, Jesus is making that equivalency. He's the one who was in the burning bush who appeared to Moses. And we'll hear about Abraham here in a little bit. But again, how will you know that Jesus is I am? You will know that when you have lifted up the Son of Man. And I think we mentioned last time, lifting up is a phrase that John likes to use. He takes it from Jesus, but John has it all throughout his gospel. That the lifting up of the Son of Man is always his literally being lifted up on the cross. So it's not God, Jesus being lifted up on our praises, then you'll know who I am. But it's actually when Jesus is crucified and he's raised up on the cross. That is the decisive point at which we see that Jesus is I am and that we realize everything that Jesus has taught, he has learned from the Father, that the Father's given that to him. And I did want to show you just a few of these. The first one we had was in John 3, and there Jesus has not yet explained what the lifting up is. But right before John 3.16, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So that again is the story of the bronze serpent, when the children of Israel were griping and complaining, and the Lord sent uh, the fiery serpents in their midst to bite them and kill them, and the only cure was, he told Moses, make the bronze serpent and lift it up on the pole. So he literally, indeed, lifted it up. There is no metaphor there. That, and so he says in the same way that the bronze serpent is lifted up, so the Son of Man is lifted up on the cross, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So looking at Jesus in faith, is analogous to looking at the snake up here on a pole. And I would like to know exactly how they affixed it. I would think they'd have to drape it so it probably looked like a big cross, you know, with a snake on it. So they kind of need I don't want to see it because the circumstances under that, you know, I don't want to be snake bit. Uh, has anybody ever been bit by a snake? Anybody been bit by a snake before? Okay. I, rem I had a teacher... She was a teacher's assistant when I was in the second grade. You're welcome. And uh, you know how you notice these things when you're a kid. She, she didn't have the top part of her thumb is like off at the knuckle. And she told us that it's because one time she'd gone strawberry picking, reached for the strawberry, got bit by a copperhead, which y'all don't have here, which is for the best, but uh, poisonous snake and uh, lost, lost, didn't lose her life, but she lost the end of her thumb. So every time I go berry picking, I think about that. On Father's Day, we're going strawberry picking, and the children are running all over. I'm like, at least there's no copperheads here. So. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes.
And even though it was so tiny, it was still fine. Yeah. I remember my granddaughter picked up a garlic snake, Morgan, and um, we thought we were protected, but that thing, we had it by the, its tail, it reached right around and bit it right on top of her hand. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, we got going Creepy, after. creepy creature. She did. I mean, I didn't get bit. But. The devil chose the right animal to use for his purposes, oh, didn't he? But, uh, all right. Anyway, so yes, lift it up on the pole. Uh, the next one we have not seen yet, but this is at the bottom of page one. When Jesus is in Jerusalem again for Holy Week, he says, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And John interprets this for us. Jesus said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the lifting up of the Son of Man, his exaltation, the way that John understands it and that he's interpreting that event for us, is Jesus' death. It's very important for us to, to keep this always in mind, is that the death of Jesus is his victory. That victory doesn't come at the resurrection, it comes before that, right? Resurrection is kind of, is when Jesus is vindicated. His resurrection is the ultimate proof that everything he said really was true. But his victory begins, and his decisive blow against the devil is when he is crucified. John, especially out of the evangelists, emphasizes this. And he takes it from somewhere else because in, in the best of Christian tradition, he steals. And uh, we won't look at the whole passage, but if you were to look at Isaiah, it's Isaiah 52, 13, which is kind of the middle of the chapter, and it goes through chapter 53. That's the passage um, that I'm sure you've heard many times and you've read when Isaiah has his prophecy about the suffering servant, how there will be one who comes who will bear the sins of the people, that he will die, um, and he'll take away our iniquities. Because all we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid the iniquity of all of us onto this one person. We always hear that as our Old Testament reading on Good Friday. We hear that whole passage. But Isaiah has that same language, and he links... It's not entirely clear until Jesus comes, but Isaiah links lifting up with the suffering. And so I gave you from Isaiah 52. This is on page two if you want to see it. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. There's the lifted up. And shall be exalted. As many were, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. He sprinkles them with his blood. That's how he purifies them. But that lifting up comes where it's prophesied, it's foretold in Isaiah, when Isaiah talks about the suffering servant. The other thing that we'll kind of see as we go on is that uh, because the cross is the lifting up of Jesus, that is also lifting up in the sense that we usually think of the term. That this is actually when Jesus is being glorified because he's accomplishing the will of the Father. He's pleasing the Father. And the other thing that he's doing, because it is his victory, is he is drawing all people to himself. He's accomplishing their eternal life. He's defeating death by his own death. And so that is, that's the crowning moment of Jesus' life and ministry is when he's lifted up on the cross. And the resurrection is kind of the epilogue to that, which is also very good. Uh, but you can't have the resurrection without that decisive moment when Jesus dies for the sins of the world. So we'll also see that as we continue on. Anything you want to ask or say about that? Yeah, Chris. Not directly related, but you said iniquity. And I'm always thinking when the iniquity is my sin, Jesus, when you say that. And I always think of it as Of iniquity? Um, well, there, hmm, I don't remember what the original word is, but uh, there, there's several different words basically just for sin. Adon, A D O N, the Hebrew word. That's the Hebrew, okay. Yeah, I, I believe you. I'm not really sure. My Hebrew's not this great. Would not, this would not lie. Yes, no, of course not. Never. It never would. I know, I know the Greek, uh, hamartia is the Greek for sin. Um, yeah, there's several, I know there's several different words, especially in Hebrew for sin, 
and I think they're basically synonymous. But, I mean, it definitely is true, it's both. Um, we have individual iniquities, and then we have just the fact of our sinfulness. Um, it says that Abai, I probably didn't pronounce it, mm -hmm. is about bestowing what was otherwise dutiful and good. No, oh, okay. He uses it to refer to behavior like murder or adultery. Okay. Yeah. But that's not Hebrew. Well, it's biblical. It's good. Yeah, I'd have to look. Yeah, there, I think there are there are like nuanced like differences between the different words, for sure. Just I mean, like there's iniquity, there's abomination, um, and I, one thing we'll talk about too is Jesus talks about in this chapter. He talks about sin in terms of slavery. That sin is not just an infraction against the law. It's not just a matter of disobedience, but sin is a power you know, that keeps us in bondage, that we have to be liberated from. So it goes a lot deeper even than, there, there's discrete things that we do that are wrong, that we're not supposed to do, but, uh, but it, it goes even deeper than that. So we'll look at that too. That's a good question. I have to dust off my, uh, my Hebrew and uh, look at that. So, I've got my, brought my Greek today. I don't know. All right, anybody else? Anything? All right, we talked about the I am stuff. So I guess uh, as we go through, especially John, and I guess as you go through life, the, basically the cross of Jesus does not um, hide and it doesn't obscure the glory of God. It's not Jesus' low point. It's, it actually reveals him. And sometimes, because it's true, I mean, we wouldn't deny, and the Bible certainly also teaches this, that Jesus' death is part of his humiliation, that it's a sorrowful thing. It's Jesus prays that he's been forsaken by God, and so on and so forth. It can be both of those things at the same time. But, you know, it's kind of like why we call Good Friday good. Why is it good? It's really good for you and me, okay? It's not, when we come to church on Good Friday, the, the tone is very different get to wear black um, but it's not a funeral for Jesus we're not I'm not sorry that he died I'm very glad actually better him than me you know that's kind of the Christian life um, but uh, it's a different kind of joy you know it's a more restrained kind of joy but it's a good thing uh, it's a good Friday the best kind of Friday so all right anything else about that so we don't shrink from the cross of Jesus, or him being on that cross, bleeding, dying, suffering, because this is the best thing that could happen. That's what he wanted to do, and that's what he was sent into the world to do. And it's the proof that God loved you. That's the way that God loved the world. All right. Well, if nothing else, where we, um, where we end in that section, in verse 30, it says, As he was saying these things, many believed in him. And I didn't give you too many notes about this, but uh, sometimes, and I think this is also unique to John, the way that he uses the word, sometimes when he talks about belief or faith, believing, it does sometimes carry that full sense of what we mean by Christian faith, by having saving faith in Christ. John 3.16 is a good example, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Sometimes, though, John uses the word, and it, it seems clear from the context in which he uses the word belief or faith, that whatever it is that people believe about Jesus doesn't seem, it might not yet be like that full, like actual trust in Jesus as the Son of God. This is a very good example of that. Because he said all these things, uh, and it says many believed in him. The next part that begins in 31, it begins with, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, and then what happens is Jesus is in another conflict with the Jews. The Jews not being every Jewish person in existence, but usually the Jewish authorities and those who are their disciples. It doesn't sound like he's addressing believing Christian people in that sense of the term. So sometimes Jesus or John uses the word that way. 
Um, the other thing is sometimes, and it's just one of those unfortunate things, is sometimes faith is begun in a person and they have true faith and then they fall away. You know, they walk away from discipleship and faith in Christ. Uh, we've been hearing these parables in church. We heard the parable of the mustard seed. We have not yet heard the parable of the sower. But this is part of Jesus' point with the parable of the sower. That the sower sows his seed all over God's creation, and some of it falls on good soil, some of it falls like on the pavement, some of it falls on the road, some of it falls in the briar patch. And he explains each of these in terms. Some of it grows up. Some of it, however, has no root. It dies either because of persecution, because of the cares of this life, or whatever. Um, so that's also in John. We saw that in John 6 when Jesus had his bread of life discourse. And he explains how he's the bread of life. That to have eternal life, you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And at the end of that, there is a sizable number of his disciples, not the 12, but some of the, the greater number of Jesus' followers, that they said, this is a hard saying. Who can accept this? And they leave. They, they stop following Jesus from that time on. And uh, it's, it looks like in John 6, at least at that time, the only people who hang with them are Peter and the other apostles. Because they were like, well, we don't really have anywhere else to go. You know, you have the words of eternal life. So faith sometimes is used in that sense, too. That faith has to be nourished, and uh, it has to cling to Jesus. Otherwise, faith dies. So belief is sometimes used that way in John. Um, and I'll show you why, why that matters. But anything you want to ask or say about that. All right, would anybody like to read? And I'll say just that first paragraph, 31 to 33, if somebody would. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. They answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to any man. How is it that you say you will become free? All right, thank you. So again, so you can see again the use of the word believe there, the Jews who believed him. It's interesting it lacks the in. You see that? There's a slight nuance in the in the Greek word. It just it doesn't say believed in him, it just said who believed him. And I wonder if that's significant. I don't really know. But they have, they have some measure of belief in Jesus. So he says to them, and here you can see part of faith is that continuance in believing in him. Because he says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Abide is another thing that we see all throughout John. Uh, that word, uh, the word is minnow, but it can be abide, like to live, or it can be to remain. So, to remain in Jesus. At the beginning of the gospel, the disciples didn't know what they were saying, something significant, but they remember Andrew and, um, what was the other one? Darn. He goes and gets Peter. Well, yeah, John, probably John. Yeah, that's Philip and Nathaniel. There's Philip and Nathaniel, but before that, I think it's Andrew and it says another disciple who I think is John. Uh, they say, teacher, where are you abiding? Where are you staying? Because we'd like to come talk to you. And of course, Jesus reels them in. He's like, oh, you want to abide with me? Okay, you can come abide with me. And then that, you know, they're off to the races for the rest of their lives on that one. But uh, yeah, and then after staying with Jesus, Andrew goes and gets his brother, Simon, and gives him the name Peter. And then uh, the same with Philip and Nathaniel. Philip meets Jesus. He goes and gets Nathaniel. Uh, but Jesus says here, so if you abide in my word. So there again is the connection. And it's the thing that the Jews struggle with the most. Uh, they did not struggle with seeing the miracles and not knowing what to make of that. Uh, the thing that they struggled with and the thing that Jesus continually rebukes them for is that they have an underlying problem where they don't believe his word. And they don't believe the word that he's fulfilling. He tells them that in John chapter 5. 
You search the scriptures because you think that in the scriptures you have eternal life, but the scriptures testify about me. So if you had believed them, if you had believed Moses and all the prophets, then you would have believed me when I come. So that's their problem. So he's telling them here, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. You can be my students if you abide in that. Um, we'll see abide again. Well, everybody's favorite hymn is basically taken from abide with me, you know. Uh, is John 15, which we heard at Easter time in church. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, if you live, you got to be connected to the vine, you know. You got to get your sap and your life and your nourishment from the vine. You have to be connected to Christ. And the branches that aren't, they get, you know, cut off and thrown into the fire because they're not good for anything. So he's calling them to do that. If you live in me, if you abide in me, you stay connected to me, you are truly my disciples. And then 32, which, interesting, like abide, abiding is living. So it's not just uh, when we're thinking about the word faith or belief. It's not just can you, um, can you check off the things, all the propositions that you assent to. I believe in the Trinity. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And uh, it's like, oh, good. And so therefore, you would be abiding with him, right? You would come and you would hear his word, and you'd continually be nourished in that faith. We've talked before about how sometimes people want to pit faith against the way that that Christian life is lived out and the way that actually that faith gets nourished. Um, and that's just my, you know, preaching to the choir, I suppose, but it's my continual advertisement for coming to church, you know, and abiding in the vine. You don't want to die on the vine. You want to abide in the Bible. All right, 32. Oh, thanks. I've never regarded myself that way, but I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, there's something else going in my mind. I don't know if I should say it just yet. Yeah. I, yeah, no, I think next time if we have any... If we have any change, like in our order of service or anything, I'm just going to say, if you want to know why, just come to Bible study. <laughs> I think I'm going to do that. So I'm not going to explain it here. You can come to Bible study. All right, that'll go over really well. All right, 32, right in the middle of the sentence. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Which is a very pro-faith kind of statement, because he doesn't say if you do something, right? I always thought it was a great illustration. I haven't used it before, but um, I've read that if you go to um, Auschwitz, or maybe the one that was in, um, where was the other one? It was in Warsaw. Concentrate. Which one? Yeah, yeah. Um, they put over the, the gate, work makes you free. It's kind of not strictly speaking literally true, um, but uh, you see the, the difference. That really will preach very well, won't it? Because the lie of the devil is that work will make you free, that you'll be able to spring yourself from the concentration camp of the devil, right? Work doesn't make you free. Actually, work is an enslaving kind of thing. But Jesus says here, you will know the truth, that it's, it's by knowing by faith the truth and the truth will make you free it's a completely passive kind of thing it doesn't require any effort on our part you, you can't break out you know Steve McQueen got out for a little while out of the great escape do you remember the great escape he ended yeah that's right he, at the end of the movie he ended back in and he was and the guys in Hogan's Heroes they had every opportunity always to escape and I always ended up with Colonel Clink you know and Schultz and all the rest of them all of our relatives, so, but anyway, yeah, how disappointed. Did they ever get out? Did anybody ever see? Yeah. Did they finally get out at the end of the show? No, I don't think so. Didn't get rescued by the Allen? They just kind of liked it. They're still there. They're still there, yeah. Still there like, um, uh, oh, it left me. Oh, well, good stuff. Cool hand Luke, he went back, you know, went back to jail. Anyway. That scene with the eggs always made me feel kind of sick, but all right. Why were we? T oh, yes, because so you'll know the truth. And the truth 
I think you should capitalize the T, that's my own opinion, because truth is not like, not an abstract concept, but something that we encounter, especially in John, is that, the, yeah, there are things that are true, but true is not really a proposition. Truth is a person, right? Because Jesus will tell us, I am the truth. I am the truth. And we see that word used all throughout John. Uh, in the prologue in chapter 1, it says that Jesus, as the only son of the Father, is full of grace and truth. That doesn't mean there's nothing else that's true, but, but Jesus is the truth in the sense of, like, everything is about him. Everything was driving toward Jesus. He's the fulfillment of all of these things that God promised. And he is everything, right? Jesus is everything. We've heard he's the light, he's the bread, he's the vine, he's the good shepherd, he's the door to the sheep. Yeah, he's the word. He's, he's everything. He is the exact expression of who God is. He's I am. So when you read that, it's not you just know the truth. Like, you know the truth about your situation. You come to grips with it. It's not that. It's you, you know you will know the person of the truth. And he will be the one to make you free. Right? He, he breaks down the doors of hell and he, he springs us from the prison house, you know, that sin has put us in. Which again is a relational thing. That's not, not a primarily like a mental or a propositional thing, but it is that, that Jesus has come and he's invaded the devil's territory and he's brought us out of that. Out of the concentration camp. All right, now look at how they respond. In this, in verse 33, this kind of gives you the hint that when John says they believed in him, we're really at this point not talking about saving faith in Christ. We're talking about something else. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? So it's hard to determine, are they, are they that obtuse or are they talking about something else? Because if you know anything about Jewish people is they have a habit of being <laughs> oppressed and subjugated. If you think just in terms of biblical history, they, they have been enslaved, in point of fact, by, yeah, Pharaoh. That was about as literal enslavement as one could get. No, <laughs> you're not allowed to forget that, I don't think. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. That's, um, they have imbued that with a religious significance. Um, it's part of their identity, you know, that they were, they were in, bondage, in bondage in Egypt and then they've been liberated. So that happened in their history. And there's been certainly others. I mean, that little patch of land in the Middle East has been controlled by any number of kings and emperors and such, and, and the time at which there's, well, actually, even before we get there, the other thing in the Old Testament, remember who carries them away into captivity. It's our friend, yeah, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonians. So then they spend like 70 years, you know, in exile, and the rest of the Jews have been dispersed throughout, you know, the Mediterranean world. So then, fresh from that, they finally, when they return to the land, they rebuild the temple, and then uh, you've, got, you've got the Persians, then you have the Greeks, right? Young man, Alexander the Great. And then the time that we're talking about now, if you don't want to call it slavery, I guess you don't have to, but they've been subjugated by the Roman Empire. You know, they, um, they are now under the Roman Caesar. They pay taxes to him. And there was a political ferment going on at that time where there were all these different factions among the Jews about how to address that. Um, they had political radicals that wanted to lead a revolution against the Romans. And that's something that's going on about a generation later. That's what leads to the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem because they were trying to free themselves from the yoke of Roman oppression. So are they that stupid? <laughs> I mean, is that what they're talking? We've never been enslaved to anybody. What's that? Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, maybe they're just really optimistic. They're just like, ah, oh, it'll pass, you know. We'll get our own homeland in 1948 or whatever. Um, 
Or maybe they're speaking in spiritual terms. I mean, I suppose that's possible, which also makes them very blind to the reality of their situation, where they, they think they're good, you know? They think, I obey God's law, work makes you free. Um, so it could be that too. The other thing is I think they're just mad at him and they're just going to say whatever because they don't know what kind of liberation he's talking about. All right, uh, anything else about that? Would somebody continue for us, 38, or I'm sorry, 34 to 38? Okay, thank you. Now something else occurred to me, which was, remember, because now this is centering on, they've made the claim, we are the descendants of Abraham, that means we've never been enslaved to anybody. Remember the Jews, they, they consider Abraham their father in, in a physical lineage kind of way, and they descend then through which son of Abraham? Yes, remember the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, that's okay. It's no shame in that. Like I said, we cheat and steal. It's the best of Christian tradition. Um, when, you know, Jacob was known as a cheater too. But, uh, yes, yeah, so they descend from Isaac as opposed to his other son, Ishmael. And remember, Ishmael was the son of Hagar, who was a, a slave. Yes. Yes, Hagar was Sarah's slave. So they're saying, what are you talking about? I did not descend from slaves. This is not roots, okay? I descended from Isaac. I descended from the son who was free. We've always been free. And I think that might be, I think I've decided now. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about how we, we've always been the descendants of the free woman and the free son. We've not enslaved anybody. And see, Jesus is talking about a slavery that goes much, much deeper than that. Because they bring in, we've got the slavery, the liberation, then our, our lineage. You've got to trace your parentage. You know, you look, you look to Abraham, and, and by extension, and by implication, you're looking to Isaac. But Jesus then explains in 34 what he means. Because he says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So that goes to what we were talking about earlier. That's, that sin is this kind of affliction where it, it is a slavery, right? It's an addiction. It's not just, I have done some things that are bad. You know, if I look at my life and I, I did that and I shouldn't have done that. That's a manifestation. That's a symptom of the slavery, spiritually speaking, that we're born into, you know, that it's the natural state because of original sin. And you can, you can modify certain behaviors in yourself, but the thing that you can't do is you, you can't, like, take the sin out of you, right? I mean, it's a defect in our nature. It's like, it's not literally, but it's like it's in your DNA. There's nothing you can do to manipulate that. And so it's, that's the kind of slavery that Jesus comes to, to set them free from, which is what he'll get to, is it doesn't matter to Jesus then how one traces his lineage, physically speaking. It doesn't make any difference, you know, that they're descended from Abraham. He acknowledges that that's literally true, but he's going to say, you know, for the way that you act, there's not much of a family resemblance between you and Abraham because Abraham believed and he was obedient and you are not. Did you have something, John? I just wanted to ask a question that you would just say. Yeah. Yeah, the ESV has practice. Whoever sins. Get out the Greek, Kelly. Let's see here. 
<laughs> you practice how you play, you know, practice makes perfect. Let's see what the Greek has. 34. Uh, it has everyone, and then it has a participle. It has uh, poion, which is um, doing, is the literal word. It says everyone who is doing the sin is a slave of the sins. So, what's that? No, I'm just looking at the Greek here. Yeah. Uh, hold on. So, yeah, I like, I like the translation of practice because um, not, not practicing, not practicing, you know, your, uh, your free throw line shot. Uh, but uh, practice as in like you make a practice of something like if your life is defined by being enslaved to sin that's something that Paul talks about where is that? that's in Romans somewhere continuing in sin the grace may abound that's Romans chapter 6 but he talks about that, that struggle within himself John also in his epistles he talks about what it means to is it, it might be the same phrase. I'd have to look at it. But it's that like being dominated by sin, ruled over by sin, and being defined by it. So, I mean, it is, it is true that apart from Christ, if you commit any sin at all, you're a slave to sin, right? You break one law, you, you've broken the whole thing. Like, you're sunk. As a Christian, we continue to struggle with sin, but the sin is not our controlling reality because we've been redeemed and forgiven you know, given the new identity. Uh, so I think that's why I like the word practice. So it's not just like I just commit sin, but it's sin is a practice of life. Yeah, but the word is doing, literally in Greek is doing. He goes on though, uh, so that's the kind of slavery we're talking about. 35, the slave does not remain See, there's the word abide again, meno. The, the slave doesn't abide in the house forever. The son abides forever. Because the thing is, if you're a slave, you know what could happen, you know? You'd be sold down the river, uh, any, anything like that. But uh, the, the slave has no rights. The son of the master, however, has every right. right? So you don't, you don't want to be in Ishmael's position. You remember what happens to Ishmael? is Sarah gets kind of jealous. And uh, even though she's got Isaac and everything, she got what she wanted. And so uh, Sarah casts them out, sends them away. And, uh, and they're permitted to go, but they don't get to stay. And Ishmael does not share in Abraham's inheritance or, or the promise. You know, the promise is passed through Isaac. Um, so you, obviously you want to be a son. You don't want to be a slave. Your future is secure. You know, it's guaranteed by being a son, by being a member of the family. And uh, the Jews make a big deal about obedience to God. The reality, though, however, is like, well, which, which would you rather? Obedience is a good thing, but they're defining their relationship to God in terms of this obedience to the law. So which one do you want? You want God as like the master over you, or do you want him as your father? You, know, you want to be a member of his family or you want to be a servant or a slave that when he's done with you, he's done with you, you know. In 36, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that's son with a capital S. That's Jesus. That Jesus is the son who liberates those in slavery. See, there, there's a ray of hope in that because Jesus is essentially saying, see, I am the son of the master. I have the power to set you free. I can make you to be not a slave anymore. You can be more than a slave. You know, you can be a son of God through faith if you know the truth. And that's how you know the truth refers to the person of the son because that sounds very much like what we saw in 32. We heard in 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 36, so if the Son, 
who is the truth, right? The Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And how does he do that? He does that through, yeah, and knowing him, right? Abiding in the word, belief in the full sense of what, you know, Christian faith actually is. All right, any questions or comments about that? All right, 37. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. Because you don't believe. You don't believe what the scriptures say. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. So now that conflict is going to get amped up in the next part. Because then we're going to talk about paternity, and people can get a little sensitive about that. And our friend Jerry Springer made a good career about that. Um, who is the father? Turns out the father of the Jews is not who they wanted it to be. But um, it is interesting because he's going to talk about the devil. right? He says, you're of your father, the devil. But uh, you, you see how he contrasts his father and their father. So Jesus says, I speak of what I have seen with my father. In other words, Jesus knows what he knows about God directly. right? He's seen it, so to speak. For them, they have not had a direct, like, immediate experience with their father because he says, um, you do what you have heard from your father. They haven't seen these realities, but they're living by a different kind of faith, the things that they have received with the ear, as opposed to what Jesus knows directly because he's from the father, he's the eternal word. Remember, he was, we heard in chapter one, he's in the bosom of the father from all eternity. Um, but uh, two, two different lines here. There's Jesus who has God as his father, and he's going to tell the Jews who reject him, you have the devil as your father. That's your lineage. I want to talk about genealogy. Sometimes there are uh, unwelcome surprises and revelations that come about with that, as Jerry taught us. So any, anything about that? See, I got my Nashville cup today. Maybe you can see it there. It's Caitlin's cup. We honeymooned in Nashville. And um, if you did not know, Caitlin is like the number one fan in the world of Tim McGraw. And uh, when we stayed in Nashville, you know, we did all the sights and stuff. And uh, Tim and Faith had just been at, I think at the Grand Ole Opry or something. So we went to the um, Country Music Hall of Fame and all of that. So we stopped in the gift shop, and Caitlin just wanted to know if they had any, anything left, you know, any merch or whatever from when Tim McGraw was there. And uh, we, you know, we were talking to the guy, so we'd just been married, all of that. She loves Tim McGraw. And uh, he goes, wait one second. And he goes behind the counter. He's got a poster. He says, this is the last one, and I'm going to give this to you as a wedding gift, signed by Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. And Caitlin was like, ah. So, still haven't had it framed, but she's got it. So, anyway, that was our little trip in Nashville. So. Where does she have that poster? Somewhere safe, but still don't have a frame. It took about uh, four years to frame our baptismal certificates for the kids, so. One day we'll frame the, the Tim and Faith poster, but uh, anyway. Yeah, well, you know, it's hard to like, like where could one put it, like in the center of the house where everybody can see it? It's like, like the lamp from a Christmas story, you know, it's got to be on full display. I, I don't but. think it'd be proper to set it like right next to Jesus, so, you know, right there. To Immediately Jesus. under, yeah, and perhaps, but uh, yeah. Well, I've decorated our house with a lot of interesting things. But anyway, all right, let's continue. Yes. Okay. Would anybody else like to read? I can read if you want, but what we'll do. Hmm. 39 to 42. Anybody want to do that? All right. Oh, go ahead, Dorothy, please.
All right, just one more, please. One more? Yeah, just one more. Okay. So they're doubling down on Abraham being their father. Now, Jesus, again, is operating at a different level because he's already, I think in verse 37, he's already granted them that. He knows, physically speaking, they're the seed of Abraham. They are not, however, spiritually Abraham's children. The, the most immediate proof of that is he said, you would be doing the works that Abraham did instead of trying to kill me. Not something Abraham would do. Um, and actually, we had a, had a fairly lengthy discussion about this several months ago when we did our end times Bible study because one of the things that frequently trips people up is um, the fact that uh, the Jews are not, in a spiritual sense, the people of God. Uh, that uh, the Jewish people were chosen for a specific purpose to bring the Messiah into the world, but uh, the people of God, the, the spiritual children of Abraham, are those who trust in Christ by faith. It, to be a member of the Christian church is to be an Israelite, spiritually speaking. Um, Jesus is, is hitting on that. He says, you're not... Abraham's children. You don't do the things that Abraham does. He'll get to. You don't believe the things Abraham believed either, because if you if you were, you wouldn't try to kill me. Um, and I gave you a few passages that you can mull over and look at. Beginning on five, Jesus has not been the only one who's rebuked the Pharisees for this. Um, during the ministry of John the Baptist, John warns them, and he says, Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. That's exactly the claim that the Jews are making, and they're making that claim against what Jesus is saying. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire which kind of gets back to the abiding. You know, you, you abide in the true vine or the branch gets cut off, you know? It's just like the ax will be laid to the root of the tree. If the tree is not good for anything, it's thrown out, it gets burned. And there's a few more. Paul especially, uh, the Apostle Paul, he really has to work on this with the people that he preaches to because of the misunderstanding about, all right, well, some of us are Jewish, you know, by, by background, some of us are Gentiles, and how it is that, that we make one people of God. In Galatians, he says, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And he says again, we look at the top of page six, and this is a great passage. He says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There's the slavery again. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So the thing that puts you into the family of Abraham is the same thing that puts you into the family of God. Be a son of God, be a son of Abraham, it comes by faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Sunday, I always put something in news and notes, 4th of July weekend, because I think it's worth thinking about, um, is uh, the reason that uh, we don't um, have patriotic celebrations and worship services is because the church is a meeting of a nation different from the nation that we are from, which is not a knock on America, but uh, the, the Holy Christian Church is its own nation. We are our own people because our, our identity is as sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So one can praise God for his nation, but the church is not an appropriate place to sing the national anthem, say the Pledge of Allegiance, and some of this kind of silly stuff 
that people do in churches sometimes. As I said, it's not a knock on being an American, but you, you look at Galatians. What is your like primary identity? Like, who are you fundamentally? Uh, these other differences that exist among peoples in terms of salvation don't matter at all. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male and female. There's no American and non-American because we're part of a different nation as Christians that the church is an embassy among all the nations of the world. And it could well be, I don't, I don't guess it's true for us, but it could be people of other nationalities who worship in our church, right? The thing that binds us together in the church is not being American, it's being Christian. So we always have to kind of watch putting out our pedigree, whatever that is. For the Jews, it was being descendants of Abraham, which got them nothing you know, in terms of eternal life. Uh, being an American is not going to get you anything in terms of eternal life. Yeah, Dory. Show the Jewish Jesus. Yes, yes, the Jewish Jesus. Every morning at nine o'clock, and the reason I do is because he parallels everything that I know as a Lutheran. I mean, he's uh, he's a Christian. He preaches the gospel. He's Jewish in roots. He, you know, he clarifies what Jewish people are historically, and you know. But I don't know how he personally came to be a Christian. But it was cool on this one interview, he was interviewing, he was being interviewed and there was a traditional Jewish rabbi there. And, you know, he said, the Jewish traditional rabbi said, well, you know, Jews don't believe in Jesus. And that Jewish rabbi just cut him off and said, well, da 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 da, -da and you should watch my YouTube channel and <laughs> Bible verses and blah, 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 blah. And Jews do believe in Jesus Christ. And I, I, so I like to watch that because it's, it, it gives you that perspective that mm -hmm. there are some Jews that do believe that are coming to that realization of, you know, who Jesus is. And, and hopefully there's a whole bunch of them, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I have it on a dish channel, you know, up on all those religious channels at nine o'clock. It's discovering the Jewish Jesus. And, uh, I Rabbi think Schneider from from Blissfield, Michigan. Oh, well, there, where think he where has is to that? To be down there somewhere similar, close to those Muslims. <laughs> you know. That? Yes. I don't know. But that's speaking my... speaking of which, I think maybe I don't know if this is what George is getting at, but um, consider like because I don't think that we understand this unless I don't know something about y'all's background. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to leave a culture because being a Jew or being a Muslim uh, is obviously sufficiently different from like, can, can we just say like regular white folk American culture, right? I'm not saying that that in and of itself is Christian, but like it is true and it's, it's kind of, people need to stop denying it. Like we all have like some kind of nominal Christianity in our culture, in our families, and all of this stuff. And I don't think that's been a bad thing at all. I wish we had a little more of it still. But, uh, but a Jew or a Muslim, like, they kind of live with all the time, if they live in America, at least America as she used to be, kind of swimming against that tide. And then, so for you to, to change religions, I mean, you think about all these things. So you lose your holidays, basically. I mean, if you're going to go, you're going to join a church, like, I know there are Jews, there are Messianic Jews who kind of, they keep in touch with that. But how many Muslim holidays can you keep when you become a Christian? That would be none, right? It's a false god. Um, your, your language, you know, if you know Arabic, you learn that because you're a Muslim. Like, your whole life is kind of oriented around something that you now have to leave behind. And the other thing that's attached with that is your family, your friends. And the Muslim world, you're dead to them, and you might literally be killed, you know, for becoming a Christian. I think that we, because of our background and the places that our families immigrated from, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, you can, you can face opposition if you have people in your family who, they're, they're not walking that way, you know, as disciples of Christ. But we have enough in common where they at least have these sensibilities where it's like, yeah, well, you know, we all get Christmas off, you know, around Christmas time. Yeah, God bless America and Jesus is great and all of that stuff. And uh, I think that we're moving toward a time when what, what is and what mainstream like American culture becomes, we might actually get a better sense if we're going to live faithfully as Christians that we do actually, that these things are two radically different things, you know, that we belong to a different nation, a different culture. We have a completely different way of life than the average American, even if they share like a lot of these qualities, sensibilities, or whatever else that, um, you know. Because it's very naive to think that, um, you know, Christian and American are synonymous. I think that's how we behave sometimes. But uh, I think we're going to be, as we go on, we're going to be increasingly disabused of that notion. And it might actually cost people something to be a Christian, you know, um, which is just how it is, you know. But anything you want to say about that? I do love this country. I'm all about, I made sure when we went to the ball game, Thomas had never, you know, heard the national anthem that I can, I mean, like at an event. So I'm like, all right, Tom, hand on the heart, look that way. There's the flag. He likes flags. Talk to him about flags sometimes. Um, yeah, he did. He wanted to know what they were singing. And uh, so we talked about that. Um, yes. All right. So yeah, genealogy and lineage is something different than the mind of God. The, the one that ultimately matters is being his child, which doesn't come, we heard in the beginning of the gospel, doesn't come through blood, will of man, will of the flesh, but of God. It's our identity. All right. Okay. 41. You want a little bit of drama. So he says, uh, you're doing the works that your father did. We have not identified their father just yet, although it's not Abraham. Now they say, this is how you have to read it. We were not born of sexual immorality. And the Greek is emphatic because it puts the we right there. We doesn't have to be there. So it should be italicized. We we're not born of fornication, unlike you, Jesus. We know who our daddy is. And uh, so that is, that's a jab at Jesus because of what they believe or what the rumor had gone around about Mary and Joseph and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, they, um, they, they are, this is a rather impolite implication that they're making. We have one father, even God. Now, this is kind of strange because they have got on to Jesus for saying that God is his father. They understand exactly the implication of what Jesus means when he says that God is his father. And, and I gave this one to you, um, some of that, that big block, the end of it, because what we heard in John chapter 5 when he had that first confrontation with them at the pool of Bethesda, it says this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, remember he healed the guy on the Sabbath, that was a big no-no, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So they get what he means. Uh, and uh, you can push the analogy only so far, but you know, Think about our fathers, uh, human fathers beget human children, all right? Uh, unlike, you know, you know where mules come from, right? That doesn't work with human beings. So for, for, for God to be Jesus' father, that means they have the same nature. They're the same kind of thing, for lack of a better term. The father's God, the son's God. They knew that's what he was saying, but here, now that they're upset at Jesus, now they've gone from 
Abraham is our father, and Jesus says, nope, wrong, guess again. They said, we have one father, that's God. So now they've made the same claim that they are trying to crucify Jesus for. God's our father, which is in the Old Testament, sometimes God is referred to as the father of Israel, but not very often. Um, primarily, they think of God in terms of he's the lawgiver. Uh, Jesus reveals at a deeper level what it means for God to be father, that you can actually belong to him in that way. But they make that claim for themselves, which really kind of heightens the uh, contrast when Jesus actually tells them who their father is. Okay, any questions, comments about that? Yeah, John. We had a comment on that before you go to 44. Yeah. In 42, <laughs> yes. the guy who your father, you would love to meet, for I came from God, and I am here. Why isn't that an I am statement? Can that be so tough? Let's look at the Greek, shall we? I'm sure the here is there, probably. That's probably why. Let's see, 42? Let's see. If God were your father, you would love me, for I came forth from the father, Heiko. All right, Heiko, let me look at, no, that's come. I've come. Eleutha. Well, where is it? But that he sent me. I'm not seeing it here. I have come. Let me look at the, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Let me look at this English. 42. For I came. Yeah, where is that? For I came. Four. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm also not seeing ego in me. I see ego. So ego is I. For I came forth from the Father and that's a present I am come I have not come for I have not come from myself but I have come from him who sent me huh yeah I don't know actually so they don't have they don't have the construction ego a me. So I wonder if the here is implied. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Let me make a note of it. I'll look at it more in depth. 42. I'll find the, I'll find the I am here for you. It's a good question. Yes, indeed. Selective hearing applies in many arenas of life. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the problem. I will look into that. I'll get back to you on, on that. Uh, bum, bum. All right. Yes, so let's look at 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Again, there's a connection between the father and the son. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord. So that is properly translated. I did not come from myself, uh, but he sent me. 43, why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. All right. So now the paternity test came back. <laughs> and the devil's your father, okay? Um, so you see the, see Jesus presents himself as he's the son of the father. He obeys the father's will. He does what the father desires. He says, you also do the will of your father. Your father is the devil. The devil's will 
he identifies these two terrible things, murder and lying. And he says that the devil in 44 was a murderer from the beginning. When you hear beginning, it takes you back to the book about beginnings, right? Back to Genesis, creation and fall, where the devil committed murder against the entire human race by leading them into sin. The reason we die is because we sin. And as we said, not, not just things that we do, but it's that state of enslavement. It's that state of bondage in which we exist as the children of Adam. Um, the devil is your father. Uh, and he, he murders because of the lie. The first lie was when he went and he deceived Eve and he said, why? Why is God so mean? Why doesn't he let you eat from that tree? And she says, because we'll die. And Satan says, flat out, snake that he is. He says, you will not surely die. And he kind of mixes a little bit of the truth in there. I mean, you do become like God if you eat the fruit. But Satan's claim is, number one, you won't die. And number two, God is kind of holding out on you by not letting you do this thing. So then Eve is deceived, and Adam is just kind of a schlub. He just kind of goes along with her. He knew better. And uh, they both ate the fruit, and they sinned. And you can put that on them, but it is also true that they're also victims of the, the devil's design, that the devil killed the whole human race when that happened. Because the day you eat of it, you will die. All of you, you all die. So those two things go together, the murder and the lies. The devil is the father of lies, which is kind of interesting because God is the father of the truth, you know, of Jesus. 45, but because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And Jesus says, lay that out then. According to your lineage, you belong to the devil, you listen to the devil, you do what the devil wants. That's why we're having this uh, failure <laughs> in communication here. Uh, because you're not from God. All right, anything about that in question? The devil does not appear very much in the Gospel of John. There's no exorcisms in John. But in this conversation, Jesus identifies his enemy and what's going on here. All right. Almost done for today. 48. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Which is not a loaded question at all. Uh, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. All right, why, why the Samaritan comment? Other than it's just kind of insulting. You know, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. It could be because the Samaritans also tried to claim that they were descendants of Abraham. You have to remember the Samaritans had their own version of uh, the Pentateuch that they doctored a little bit. It's where it says, you know, the temple should be on their mountain, on Mount Gerizim. Remember, he had that conversation in John with the woman at the well. She wanted to talk Bible and stuff. And she said, the Jews say you worship on Mount Zion, we say you worship on Mount Gerizim. And Jesus says, you need to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. But they had their own temple, they had their own sacrifices, all of these things, and they wanted to lay claim to being the true Israelites. So now that, so they contested, of course, what the Jews said. The Jews said, we're descended from Abraham. The Samaritans said, no, we are. So they're saying, oh, you're a Samaritan because you're saying we're not descended from Abraham. We're descended from the devil. And maybe not that, maybe you're just a demon or maybe you're, you know, demonically possessed. Jesus, because he doesn't care about the lineal stuff, he disregards the Samaritan comment. He just says, I don't have a demon, I'm actually from God, you know. And the Father honors me, which is what you would do if you knew me. Verse 50, yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. That would be the Father. The Father is going to glorify the Son, especially, I mean, all his life, but especially 
and his crucifixion. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And remember, we're speaking, Jesus always speaking at another level. So he's not saying that you won't die bodily, but uh, death won't be that big of a deal for you. You know, um, you won't die spiritually, won't die eternally, but uh, you're given eternal life. And uh, Jesus says something very similar when we get to John 11 with uh, Lazarus. Remember when uh, Martha comes and, and speaks to him? And uh, we have another I am statement. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Will never see death, you know, if you keep my word. Not, you know, separation from God, not condemnation or anything. And this is the straw that breaks the camel's back here. 52, the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus is saying that he's got the secret to immortality. And they obviously are not going to believe that Jesus is greater than Abraham or Moses or any of the prophets. So they think that like this is like the sheer audacity and the gall of what Jesus is saying. So you, you have done better. You are greater than Abraham, our father. You've got the cure for death. All those men died, and so you're, you're better than they are. So they're driving exactly to Jesus' point, actually. Who do you make yourself out to be? 54, Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. Because remember, he doesn't act separate from the Father. They have the same glory. We confess in the Athanasian Creed, uh, the, the glory co-eternal, the majesty co-equal. It's the same because they're fully God. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. The implication of that is he's not your God. You know, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. But you say that he is. 55, but you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. See, Jesus does that very thing that he calls us to do. That in his humanity, he obeys the Father as we should. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham is always presented in the scriptures as a man of faith. And all of these promises that finally come to pass in Jesus are made to Abraham. You could go through the book of Genesis and see uh, that he promises that your offspring, your seed, will be as numerous as the stars of heaven, the sands of the sea. All the nations of the world will be blessed through you. Kings will come through, you know, from your line. And that promise passes on, right? Just to Isaac, and Jacob, and so on down the line until Jesus is finally born as the, the seed of Abraham. And not only that, but Jesus is saying that Abraham foresaw the coming of Jesus, and he rejoiced to know that Jesus was coming. Abraham recognized him in type and shadow and prophecy in the Old Testament. Here in the New, they don't recognize the truth right in front of their face. If he was a snake, he would have bit him, you know. But uh, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. 57, so the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? So 50, I guess that means 50 is over the hill. <laughs> um, that's where we get it, yeah. Jesus was not 50, they're right about that. Um, Jesus is approximately 30, he's 33 when he dies. Um, 50 might not be like a literal number. Uh, the one thing that I found is that uh, if you were a Levite, you're, you were retired at 50. 
I guess worse things in the world could happen to you. But at 50, your time of service in the temple was over. So the people who were charged with teaching the people and administering the sacrifices and stuff, when they reached 50 years old, their time of service was ended. So it could be that they're saying, there are Levites older than you, and, you know, you'd have to be really old. I mean, you'd have to be 50 plus to have known Abraham. You're not that. So how can you say that you've seen Abraham? In 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. If they didn't get it before, now he's said. So not only did, did Jesus know Abraham, but he pre-existed Abraham. Before Abraham came into being, Jesus was always there. Jesus was the one who created all things. He made the covenant with Abraham and so on. So the answer to their question is, yes, in fact, I am greater than Abraham. I really do. I, I'm able by my word to make it so that you'll never see death. And they're picking up now what he's laying down because 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And we've seen several times now throughout the Gospels that Jesus does exactly this. It happens here it happened in chapter 5 at the Pool of Bethesda. It happens um, when he comes and he preaches in Nazareth at the beginning of his ministry. That if they ever have any designs to kill Jesus before his time, Jesus being God can evade them until the time is right. So that's what they do. They pick up the stones to throw at him because they believe he's committed blasphemy. So he kind of just right, right through their midst and he leaves the temple. It's a good question. The, the temple was still under construction at that time. That Herod, they had, that had been his thing. You know, one of his major public works projects was he kept, you know, kind of messing with it. So it's conceivable that there are some fairly big rocks just kind of lying around, and they're like, just, you know, from the, you know, what we do. Um, if you know where we live, our cross street down there is Fair Lane, and there's a house that burned down in the wintertime, and uh, right across from the fairground. So Thomas especially has been very interested. He calls it the burnt down house, and we've been watching the progress, you know, as they build up the house. So the same kind of thing, you know, you just go over to the construction site, grab yourself a brick, and you can throw it at the guy who claims to be God. So anyway, they're almost done, though. I think they, they built an even nicer house than was there before. So. But um, I know it's, it looks so huge. I don't know. I didn't know a house that size could fit on that. But what's that? I think there is it brick. Is it brick? No, I guess it's wood. Well, you know. So it goes. But anyway, yeah. So that's why they had a stone nearby. They had a stone that they could grab. But it won't matter because Jesus evades them. Goes out of the temple. And he will be back, of course. Um, what we'll see next time. Does anybody have any closing? No. What we'll see next time is chapter 9. Great stuff. The man born blind. And, of course, that again. Jesus heals him. Brings him into conflict with the Jews. Uh, but it's a great story. So we'll do that next time. Eventually, and I don't think it'll be... Well, maybe it will. There'll be a few times in the summer where we won't have Bible study, and I'll let you know in enough time. So, but right now, I think most of July, we're just keeping on as usual, but I'll let you know. So, all right. Well, thanks so much. How about we close with a word of prayer? Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your revelation that you give us in your Son. We thank you that although we were... Uh, born in bondage to sin and under the power of the devil, that you have given us the truth, uh, that by your grace we have known the truth and that you have set us free. We pray always that we would abide in your word, uh, that we would gladly receive and cling to uh, this word uh, that gives and strengthens our faith in you. We ask always uh, that you would keep us under your fatherly care, be with us in all of our coming and in our going. 
uh, that we might uh, do those things that you command and always find refuge in your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you.